Okay, so we're live. We're live, but we need to do the and recording as if we're like, so we need to do the introduction. Do the introduction. That's a good point. Right, okay. Um, hey everyone, welcome to Grow Money. We're calling this out, I was calling the series Grow Money, David. This is David Morgan, legendary silver and precious metals investor and financier actually as well. Um, and we just did our Gold and Silver for Life Accelerator Mastermind in London and we had uh, some time and we thought we'd record one of these episodes of Grow Money. Um, I think you guys, the feedback's been good from what Deep has said and what you guys are saying on social media. So we thought we'd start doing some of these and we thought we'd bring a guest. And that's as far as uh, I like to go, as far as putting any effort out to create content. I'll hand over to Deep now. Okay, so uh, firstly, you know, thank you for tuning in. Those of you who are tuning in on Facebook Live, and uh, we'll begin with a discussion about you know, what's, what's hot and what's on people's minds right now. So perhaps the, uh, the best way to start really is discussing a little bit about cryptocurrency. That seems to be hot right now. Everyone's talking about it. It seems to be you know, making new highs and then sort of leveling off, making new highs again. So let's begin by explaining a little bit how a cryptocurrency in this case, Bitcoin actually comes about. So I'll, I'll open this up to either one of you, who, whoever wants to answer the question. What, what is a, a, a Bitcoin? How does it come about? You know, how is it sort of brought into existence? Whoever wants to start, David Minesh, any? I, I don't want to talk about Bitcoin okay. as far as that goes. So I'm not good at it. I don't know about Bitcoin. No, I'm not I will trash it. Basically. If you let me talk about Bitcoin for more than 30 seconds, I'll trash it. Okay. <laughs> well, Bitcoin was an idea. And it started uh, with mining, which meant uh, anyone had access to a computer and, and learned about Bitcoin could basically mine the coin. And of course, it's all out in cyberspace. And that's basically how it started. And then it started to catch momentum like any new idea. And it became uh, the number one leader in the cryptocurrency uh, realm. There are some drawbacks. I addressed that in my public essay by two bits about Bitcoin. And one is that uh, the processing time continues to uh, take more and more time because it wasn't uh, designed to handle massive amounts of transactions per second. It can't compete with uh, MasterCard or Visa or any right. electronic platforms that we have now. And there's going to be a fork, I understand, that will take care of that problem. So there are some issues about it. I like the fact that it's a limited supply. So it's like cutting off the currency supply. But uh, I'm not a huge fan, but I'm not against it. In my first and only public article, I've written about it in the morning report several times, but for the public domain only once. And I said, if I'm really who I say I am, free market, then if the market decides Bitcoin's a good thing, then who am I to say that you know I prefer specie money over uh, electronic digit money only? Uh, the market decides those things, not me. Okay. and. Uh you mentioned, of course, Bitcoin is, is limited in supply and, and there is a limited number of Bitcoins that will ever come into existence. Um, is there a possibility that Bitcoins could continue to be produced in different forms, in a different cryptocurrencies currently in the market? So would it be, could there be a parallel drawn to simply printing money in terms of not having more Bitcoin, but having more choice, wide variety of, kids of cryptos. Yeah. And I'm probably not the, the best to uh, you know go with this, but I know enough to speak to it somewhat intelligently, at least hopefully. So a lot of the new platforms are based on, on Bitcoin. In other words, for XYZ crypto, the only way you can engage in that new platform is by using Bitcoin. So it's become kind of the... Uh, the number one reserve currency of the crypto world, basically. It's the US dollar as a metaphor to the cryptocurrency. Well, that's what I call it. And that's what it is. It's the I US mean, dollar. You, in order for you to get into it, yeah, and you can just add on, but yeah. So to answer your question, the answer is yes. These others that are unlimited are based on a Bitcoin in most cases, and that creates like the euro and you know the Cando and whatever the Australian dollar, etc. Because you could use that as a metaphor for what's going on. Do you want to add on to that? Image? No, I think I think you're absolutely right. I just cannot trust Bitcoin as a store of wealth. People always take my um, judgment of Bitcoin as a store of wealth as a judgment on the tech value of the technology behind it. I actually, I'm a big believer in the blockchain technology. I just don't like that you 
I, it's not like it just doesn't make sense to me how it remains a store of value over a long period of time especially when I mean people's biggest fears right now are the banks are gonna collapse well what if some hacker sitting in with the remote parts of Russia hacks into your Bitcoin account and suddenly all of your wealth is gone you know it, that doesn't it doesn't make sense to me from that perspective I like the transactional side of Bitcoin I just don't like the store of wealth side of Bitcoin uh, and it's not, you know, it's funny, as much as they say Bitcoin is the future of money, it's, to me, it's not future proof. Because there can always be someone in the future that is figuring out how to hack it. Mm -hmm. Gold is future proof, past proof, it's, 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 it's proven. It, there's no reason to, uh, to doubt it. So that's my philosophy of Bitcoin. It just doesn't make any sense to me. It's like the new version of the US dollar. It's more fiat than the US dollar. It doesn't make any sense. Okay, and uh, another interesting part, but maybe a lot of people don't fully know, but how did, who created Bitcoin? There's a, a lot of rumors surrounding who created Bitcoin, who was the founder, was it a person, was it a, a corporation, a group of people? Um, I take it, David, you might know, or might have some ideas or uh, maybe some research. Only to give credit where credit's due, uh, Charles Savoy, who's a name that's not very well known, but he wrote when I started The Silver Investor, in fact, he's one of the first people that ever reached out to me. He did it under a pseudonym at the time, not that I care. And it kind of gave me a one or two sentence thing and I contacted him and then he started writing and all of his work, or at least the majority of it's on still to this day for free for everyone at the Silver Investor website. But he wrote, and he does deep research, really good research. And I don't want to misquote him, but basically he brought up the possibility slash probability of uh, one of the major agencies producing uh, the Bitcoin under the pseudonym, and I can't pronounce the gentleman's name or the person's name, that's uh, deemed to be the creator of Bitcoin. Now, I'm not saying that I know that as a fact, I'm just taking it as the question was posed. Mm -hmm. You know, do you know? And the answer is I do not know. But I don't take it outside of the realm as a uh, the deep state taking a test case and seeing what the reaction of the public does. Mm -hmm. They do these trial balloons all the time. In fact, they use countries as right. test cases to see how far they can push the citizenry in the direction they want to push them. So just leading on from that, could that be a ploy to move towards a cashless society? Do you think that a lot of people are discussing at the moment? I think it's a probability. I do believe strongly that uh, the global empire at large wishes to make a cashless society and every transaction to come off some platform, be it your, uh, your mobile phone or uh, something that's uh, indented into the human body or uh, your thumbprint or your iris scan or whatever. I really believe that's the direction that we're seeing. I think we can make a case for that just with what we know exists right now. And in that case, you've given up all privacy and to me, that's something that uh, we should question, you know. And the other part of it is, if we have to be so transparent to do commerce, why aren't they so transparent? Why don't we get to see into the deep state and see who's in charge? And, you know, all these half a percent fees that the banks gather for our transactions and those types of things. We, I digress, but the movie The Circle, which I think was a metaphor for Google, but it, how, that's how I saw it. But at the end of the movie, they uh, put this girl in, you know, 24 hour a day, I'll call it surveillance, but transparency, we can call it that. And she's got nothing to hide and she goes back. But it starts to great on her because one of the founders of the company kind of backed out because he saw where it was going, he saw the dark side of it. Right. And so she turns the tables and put, you know, everything, oh, it's so great. And she goes, yeah, and it's so wonderful. And now you and you get to be transparent to everybody. It's so fair. And both the leaders that are way behind the scenes on a firewall, no one gets to see what they're dreaming up with the peons. Yeah. All of a sudden, they're totally transparent. The whole thing collapses. Yeah. So something to keep in mind. That actually highlights the value of secrecy, right? Like being a rand, being an Ayn Rand sort of, I'm not a hardcore Ayn Rand listener, but I believe in conservatism and everything else. And so then it brings in the value of, of secrecy. And can there be innovation without secrecy? At least in the starting points, right. right? Like, so that's always interesting to me. 
Okay. So we've discussed Bitcoin a little bit. Let's uh, let's move on a little bit further now, and uh, let's. So just... uh, you, so if the purpose of this episode is or this series is called growing money, I think one question we should answer is: Should people put their wealth into crypto? Because we've discussed the, the essence of crypto, but should people put their money into it? Personally speaking, I think as a trade, potentially. As a long-term store of wealth, you should bang your head against the wall first before you do that. What do you think? Oh, I add on to that. Sure, I think it's a highly speculative environment. Whenever a market's really hot, you've got to be very nimble. You get in and you get out. I mean, one of the guys that works for me uh, put in uh, a very modest amount. Four months later, he cashed out, uh, if I do the math in my head, about 70-fold in yeah. four months. I mean, you know, he's very happy. But that's, I think, the approach right now, especially on these newer ones that really don't, you know, aren't, let's say, seasoned like the Bitcoin world is. Yeah. But he cashed out. Absolutely. Yeah. He's not going back in. Right. With that one, he might do another one. Well, yeah. right, okay. That's interesting. So does he feel that Bitcoin is, has reached its, its peak? Is he right? I haven't had that Bitcoin? conversation with him, but I think his approach is that there's these new ones are out accelerating Bitcoin on a percentage basis. And that's a place to you know, make bets. I mean, to me, again, they're speculative. They're not long-term stores yeah. of wealth, at least not yet. And uh, there's also, I think, a place for gold-backed, silver-backed type of cryptos. And there are some out there. I know that I can't name them. But uh, I think that may be the next level to this cryptocurrency. And the big eye-opener to me is when I did the Anarchapoco conference. And Jeff Baruch does really, in my opinion, a very good job, and he brings all kinds of uh, eclectic, intellectual, free thinkers to the event. It was really great to be there. And one of the really smart guys on the Bitcoin world has been with it from pretty much the inception, talked about it's really not as uh, safe, let me rephrase that, it's not as anonymous as people are led to right. believe. Right. He said, Point blank, and I think I can quote him, and if I'm wrong, Jeff will certainly get back to me, I'm sure, but that basically everything on the blockchain can be uh, brought up again by somebody else, especially like the NSA as an example. So if you think you're using a blockchain or Bitcoin and you're remaining anonymous, think again. Yeah. Interesting. Some interesting points raised there. And does Bitcoin actually, is Bitcoin more easily confiscatable than cash uh, or real money? That I can't answer. But do you, get, but do you, do you see my train of thought? Oh, I do, it's, yeah. It's almost as if, if everyone went on to Bitcoin, it would be easier for the government to confiscate. Yeah. Or it would go into what we started the conversation right. with, that they want to see and know everything you do, everywhere you are, right. every transaction you make. But no one gets to look at them. Right. Why isn't this a two-way street? You know, why do you need to know everything about me when I get to know nothing about you? Right. Don't I want to interrupt anymore. <laughs> My skepticism will forever be, uh, forever continue on Bitcoin. Yeah, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are very interesting. Very early in their, in their life cycles, I think, but uh, we'll see what happens with those. And it's up to yourselves whether you choose to, uh, to invest or, or not invest. You know, don't take our, our word for it. Go and do your own research on it. Yeah, this isn't advice. It's just Correct. really our opinion for what it's worth. Entertainment, Entertainment purposes, purposes. <laughs> So, okay, we've spoken about Bitcoin. Um, let's talk about something else which, you know, potentially could be in a bubble. Um, you know, Bitcoin was one of those things, potentially. Could Bitcoin be. could be the ultimate bubble. Could be. Like, so far in history, it could be the ultimate bubble. It's possible. But it's, it's shocking. It's like, could be the, the modern-day tulip. Absolutely. And for those of you watching who don't know the tulip theory, um, I don't know if you care to, of course, explain exactly what that Well, it was one of the biggest bubbles in financial history, and at the top of the market, see if I can get this right, I think one tulip bulb sold for a uh, somebody from the craftsman class 10 years worth of labor. And Whoa. then after it crashed, it came back down to just a tulip bulb. But it shows the power of a mania, the power of the herd mentality the power of momentum, and the power of people wanting to get rich quickly. Yeah. And several did, but most people stay too long. And that's my suggestion yeah. on the cryptos. 
is in this phase of the market, I don't know how long it's going to go. I don't know. I think the blockchain is here to stay. Yeah. I believe that. I believe that too. But whether or not you know XYZ coin is here, you know, three years from now, that's pretty hard to determine. But the tool, the bull mania, is a, a psychological experience that will be uh, that comes about every so often and will happen again. And is Bitcoin one or not? We don't know. But you can certainly make that analogy right now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so just moving on from there, and then obviously continue that trade of thought, bubble trade of thought. Let's talk about something else a lot of people would be considering getting into right now uh, the stock market, namely. Are we at the euphoria stage now? Are we at the, uh, the tipping point potentially? Are we looking at a pullback in the next couple of years? I mean, let, let, let's, let, before, before we answer that, let, let's answer another question. I mean, since 2008, Obviously, the stock market has pretty much gone up in a in a very steady line, uh, without any any major pullbacks or anything like that. Was that purely due to the debt binge that all of these big companies go to? Was it organic growth, or was it just debt fueled growth? These companies loaded up on debt, purchased loads of other smaller companies, expanded their operations, so on and so on, and that's led to obviously the stock market getting to where it is now. Well, I'll answer in two ways. The latter part of the market's been fueled by easy money from the Fed. But prior to that, the values were so, you know, as a value investor, they were absurdly, uh, you know, valued at the 2008 crisis. So people that had the ability to not get emotional and see the opportunity in 2008 just loaded up. went in and loaded up. And in fact, the point blank about it, probably use margin as well, because yeah. you were scooping these things up at unbelievable levels. But then it started to move up. So markets go from undervalued to fair value to overvalued. We've been overvalued in the stock market by any metric you choose to, to analyze and buy for a very long time. We've also been in what I call a distribution pattern for a very long time. Because if you're a big player in a commodity of stock and you start to sell if you're a major pension fund, let's say, and you sold all of your holdings at one time, it would move the market. I mean, if you have a lot, you know, it depends. And so if these guys are smart. Smart money is always smart. So they get out by a distribution. In other words, you sell a little bit today, yeah. the next day, the next week, and you unload your position slowly over time so that you can get the best price, which is what you want. You're an investor. So the overall market's been in a distribution pattern for a very long time. The money's been moving from smart money into what I call the strong hands, the weak hands, a well-known metaphor. And now the smart money is actually moving into the gold market through the ETFs primarily, whereas the market's being held up by the other side. The less sophisticated money is buying it. So you're seeing this. So I think not only is it overvalued, but I think we're due for a correction probably between 2018 2020 it'll probably be a steep correction and then we'll have to kind of wait and see from that point you know where it goes but i'm not predicting um even this year although there's always a higher probability in the september october time frame seasonality wise for a pullback in the stock market but whether or not it happens in 2017 18 19 i really don't know yet i yeah i think i Pullback is 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 likely. I don't know how big it's going to be, but pullbacks happen all the time. Um, I think a major correction is nowhere near term in sight. Near term being one to two years. I don't think it can. I, I don't know what what would cause it. There's no reason for lack of confidence. There's no reason for the credit markets to blow up just yet. There's. I don't know that if there's any reason that would cause a major correction in the stock market in the next one or two years. The markets are irrational, so there doesn't right. have to be a good reason, right? Because the momentum and you know and the fear and the, and the greed oscillate. But having said that, there's so many um, measures that are installed right now right. that with the circuit breakers, etc., and maybe AI running it, whatever your definition of AI is that with the algorithms and these computers trading against each other constantly, right. I don't see a real huge drawdown because of the way the system is set up right, right now. I mean, if it gets into a panic sell, 
the circuit breaker will be popped out and they'll stop all trading for an hour. Yeah. And they'll put the circuit breaker back in. If it falls even more, they'll pull the circuit breaker out and they'll stop for two hours. So they have a lot of control. They, the plunge protection team or the Google, what is it, financial group, well, I'm not going to say it, but the working group on financial markets, the SEC, the Federal Reserve, the top of the uh, CFTC, all these powers that be, and that's just on the U.S. side, which is the dominant market still, obviously, have the ability to basically do whatever they need to do to prevent a panic in the market today. So it's a different circumstance than it was in the 1930s or even in the 1987. In fact, the Working Group on Financial Markets was a direct result of what happened in 1987. Yep, I agree. Right, okay. Um, obviously, moving on, we talked about what could be a possible cause for a stock market correction. Is it simply the stock market has become too overvalued because people have got carried away with, for some may say, the, the, the Trump presidency and the promises that rang? Could it be further down the line that you know six, seven months, a year down the line, President Trump fails to deliver on some of his policies and some of his reform promises? And uh, could that potentially be? Uh, the reason why the stock market corrects could it potentially be the Federal Reserve announcing it's going to start unwinding its bed, its, uh, its balance sheet? Could that have an effect on confidence? Could that affect the, uh, the stock market? Could it be bonds even? Bonds have been on a multi-decade bull run now, and do you think potentially there could be some kind of correction in the bond territory? Sure. Well, I have a very interesting answer for you. Uh, very often, in fact. There's whole publications that do nothing more than try to answer the question why. And for me, it's almost meaningless. I was just because, <laughs> because it really doesn't matter right. why it happened. As long as it, does it happen or does it not happen? It happened. The reason the market goes down is because there's more sellers than buyers. Right. And to really know why, you'd have to ask every one of those people, or funds, or family offices, or whatever, why did you sell today, Dean? And you say, well, because I had such a huge profit and I wanted to rebalance my portfolio. And then I asked Manesh, he said, well, you know what, I got a phone call from my friend Deep, and he said he's getting out of the market, so I decided to do the same thing. So knowing why, it can't be some value, but I do want to add on to that on the bond side, because the biggest threat to the financial system to me is the debt markets. And for the debt markets to work, they have to continually grow. And if they don't grow, they stagnate or, co or collapse. And collapse doesn't mean overnight the end, it can mean a slow deterioration. And that's what we're watching right now. We're actually seeing the debt markets are not growing. They're starting to uh, wane. And because they are falling off slightly, this is not good for the overall system because it means that we are not able to increase the money supply without the market reacting to it, which is the debt market. So we have negative interest rates in, what, 900 billion worth of bonds or something? I don't know if I got the number right. But the idea is there's many major nation states or the euro where you're getting negative return. Think about that. Does that make any sense to even a six-year-old? You give the bank your money and you're guaranteed that you'll get less back in the future. Hmm, kind of interest am I getting on my money? And yet people accept these premises. So They're buying them up by the boatload. That's what's yeah, hilarious yeah. about the whole thing. So we're in dangerous waters, in my opinion, especially in the debt. I've always said, you know, watch the bond market. That's the place. And the problem to me is that everyone thinks the safest place you can be is in a government-backed bond. The debt markets are the most secure investment you can make. And gold is risky. And I ask the question, how long has gold worked? Thousands of years. How many bonds have gone to zero? Franz Pitt, not well known, known to my generation, called bonds certificates of guaranteed confiscation. Right. And his point was that when you put your money at, at a term for a reasonable amount of time, five year, 10 year, 30 year, you're guaranteed to get back less in purchasing power. Guaranteed. Right. And yet people think this is the safest, soundest investment. And so you could be a bank, you could buy treasuries, you can go in and use that treasury as a collateral to lever up 10 to 1 and take that 1% interest, which is almost meaningless to the average person, but if you do 10 to 1, you're getting 10% on your money 
for loaning a Lindbergh investment. It's really insane what's going on. You know, the whole system is based on this idea that it can only grow. Yeah. And nothing grows to the moon. Nothing. Not even the bottom market. Interesting. I heard someone describe the, uh, or some parts of the bond market as a return free risk. That's a very good one. Thank like, well, you. Yeah, it could be we'll a, an interesting way of describing yeah. it. Okay, so let's let's move on a little bit further now. And some people may be considering, right? Okay, what do I put my money in right now? If if someone is is watching and have limited funds, we're not talking about someone who's mega rich, who has a lot of you know investment capital available to them. The average Joe, who perhaps has five to ten thousand dollars in savings, what do they do? What do they put their money in now? So that they can see that money grow, you know, over the next decade or so, and then potentially, you know, pass them on to, to their children and, and so on. What did you guys think is the best investment for that sort of person? I'll start, but I'm going to pass it to Manesh. I think you know he did a triangle of investment, and it was very well done and very simple to understand. I mean, basically, for a long term, you want to have. You know, some portion in gold, silver, precious metals, you want some in real estate, you want some in the stock market. And you want to balance those appropriately. Yeah. However, as I said earlier, all markets go undervalued, fair value, and overvalued. We know the stock market's overvalued right now. The real estate market from the United States in most major cities is overvalued. London is overvalued. Toronto's already seen the bubble pop. Toronto's a good case study for what I think is going to happen in other cities here in the near future. So from my perspective, well, the only place that's undervalued right now is the precious metals. Having said that, they are, they are volatile. And there's nothing wrong with sitting on cash. And I don't think I emphasize this enough, and I don't think a lot of people in the monetary world emphasize it enough. Sometimes the best place you can be is in cash out of markets. And unless you really know what you're doing, and you do, and I'm going to pass it over to you in a second, but there's nothing wrong with turning that 10000 into 20000 and getting into the market with more cash later in the cycle where it's more well-defined of what to do. And maybe at that point in time, it would be best to go into all three because the housing market is starting to settle down, the stock market has had a pretty decent correction, it's more fairly valued, and the metals have come up into a reasonable space. But uh, timing is difficult. I do it, but I don't get it right all the time. And people want to, you know, they want to always be right. There's a psychology, especially surrounding money, that, you know, when I get in, I got to start making money right away. As soon as I get in, my stock's got to go up, or my ETF's got to go up. Or, and that's a very unrealistic attitude. Try I running teach. a business like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so let me hand it over to you. I'm sure you can add on to that. I, I, I gen generally think um, at this point, if you've got five to ten thousand dollars, you should never, you shouldn't even be focused about making money through investing. I think you should just be thinking about how do I protect the value of the money that I have, and then how do I increase my income. And you should be focused on other ways to increase your income. I think at five to ten thousand dollars, calling yourself an investor is. Um, it's a very uh, immature thing to do. I think your, your goal should be, okay, I'm gonna put this money into gold, into silver, into index funds, into whatever. It really doesn't even matter at this point in your life. Um, you should just put it in something that hedges the, the deterioration of cash. Uh, and then once you've done that, your primary sole life focus should be on how do I increase my income, whether that's through a job, a business, your own business, whatever you want to do, your, your focus is completely on the wrong thing. If at five to ten thousand dollar level, right? Okay. And if someone simply wanted to protect themselves through whatever risk they see in the economy, anything at all, would you guys both be in agreement, or perhaps recommend that they just purchase some physical gold or silver and, and just sit on that something outside of the the banking system, outside of the economic system? stored at home kind of thing? Definitely would. I mean, the problem is, again, that people get in and they expect it to, you know, do well for them immediately. But having a more mature attitude about it, one is dollar cost average. You don't have to do it overnight and expect to win as soon as you put in your $5,000 as an example. Uh, markets, especially the commodities markets, are, again, like any market. And we're at a point in the silver market or basically at a gold market. Both of the precious metals are basically selling for cost of production right. for major businesses. So we're talking business. So let's be business people about our attitude toward the precious metals. If I'm running a billion dollar gold company 
and I'm just breaking even at uh, 1250 gold. And I'm out there with $5,000 to invest, and the market drops to 1200 gold. I'm now a gold investor that's doing better than one of the top tier gold mining companies in the world. Right. And I can hold gold for a long time. It doesn't rot. It, it's been money for thousands of years. People trust it everywhere in the world. Is that a bad attitude? No, I don't think so. Does that mean you put all your money in gold? No, it does not mean that. What it does mean is it's doing its job. Gold's job, in my view, is to protect wealth for long periods of time. Does the price of gold go up and down? Absolutely. The price of gold goes up and down. Yeah. But an ounce of gold is the same ounce exactly. anywhere in the universe forever. Yeah. Yeah. So what changes? Basically what changes is the money supply around gold and people's perception of how it should be valued and something that you can create to infinity. Hmm. What does that mean? It means that fiat currencies have always failed and gold is to the test of time. Yep. Not the opposite. Yeah, I always like to say price is just a perception of value. Value is not a perception of price. Like it's a completely different thing. You know, and I think, you know, the whole thesis of I fundamentally everyone should have at least five thousand US dollars worth of gold or silver at this point. Um, I think that's a pretty good hedge. At the same time, the other side, the more entrepreneurial side of me goes, if your life at this point is worth five to ten thousand dollars. Forget gold and silver, go out and just leverage that five or ten thousand dollars through entrepreneurial spirit and create and put yourself in a position to create more wealth for yourself. So rather than investing five thousand dollars in silver, if your overall portfolio is only worth ten thousand, I would rather say go and buy books, go and buy right. things like that and figure out how to turn that ten thousand dollars into five hundred thousand dollars and then go and buy some gold and silver and you can only do that through business no matter what I say or we say or anyone says um, if you want to do things safely in the investment world it's not going to have enough of a leveraging point as a business world and you should like I do I keep all of my risk in my businesses and like all of my investing is super boring and super easy yeah, right because right? I don't want to touch that it's yeah. just super easy and boring so if you've got, if your life right now in your net worth is five to ten thousand dollars, this is too much of a stress for you. You shouldn't even be thinking yeah. about investing right now. Yeah. Invest in yourself. Invest Sorry. in yourself. Yeah, I agree. And I was thinking, what seminar do I tell them? Because there's so many out there, and there are some good, but there's a lot of not so good. But I think books are the best. Yep. You know, and there's so much availability now with the internet that you can watch some really good lectures that really. You know, cause you to think and evaluate and learn. And you know, well, I started investing in gold and silver because watching your YouTube stuff that right. was free. Yeah. Right. So it's uh, it, that there is more leverage than investments when your net worth is ten thousand dollars. You shouldn't even be thinking about investing. I always tell people, people that want to join our, our program, if they tell me I've got you know a twenty thousand dollar overall portfolio, I don't become a client. That's right. We, don't. We, we don't become a client. It's not good for you. Um, so yeah, I always believe that. I hate it when people say, "Oh no, you must invest if your net worth is ten to twenty thousand dollars." No, you've got to invest in yourself. Make yourself more valuable to the world. Attract more wealth, and then let's talk about investing. Just continuing on from that, we're talking about investing on yourself and and talking about books, of course. Could you name one book that you think helped oh, you the most that could potentially help everyone else? And, and if I ask David the same question, the one book that has really that's hard changed your philosophy. I think securities analysis. I mean, Graham. I mean, I don't know. There's so many out there, but I think the fundamentals. If people are in a, it's called a false reality. You know, I mean, I'm as guilty as anybody, but we're walking down the street looking at this thing, you know. And value investing, I think, still holds a very important part. That's why I answered the question that you asked, Steve, yeah. about where would I go now? I'd go with, to what's, what, what is undervalued. Uh, so I think the basis of the most basic way to value business, and what people don't really understand about the stock market anymore, this is my perception, is that people's dream in America especially seems to be, might be worldwide, I want to own a business. And the way the stock market is supposed to work is that you are an owner of business. Right. I can be an owner of IBM. I can right. be an owner of Apple. Right. But what, business, what do you do for a living? Well, I you know, 
I wait tables. And what else? Do you have any other business interests? Yes. I am an owner of Apple. You're an owner of Apple Computer? Yeah, I own a share in Apple Computer. Does it, but the metaphor is, and the reality is, you are. And that's the idea. So, it, you know, only in kind of the American dream, if you want to call it that, can you be a business owner. But what happens is, people get the, they don't even have that idea going in. They don't think like Buffett thinks, I'm buying a business. Right. They think I'm buying a stock. Right. No. And when you go out on the street and you're going to make a purchase, be it uh, retail for clothes or maybe for food or maybe for entertainment or whatever, you usually go get the best you can get for whatever you can afford. And we all have different brackets or whatever. And that's the way you should buy companies. Most people buy cheap companies. But when they go to buy jeans, do they buy the cheapest jeans they can find? Usually not. They go get the best they can afford. And to be the same way in stock investing or business investing. And that's what you should do. You, you would be much better off having one share of Apple over the last 10 years than a bunch of, let's say, penny mining stock. Because those are extremely risky. And your ability to make money on those are extremely difficult. And so you're much better buying the best of the best. And that isn't emphasized enough. Shop and buy companies the way you shop and buy for anything else in life, instead of trying to find the deal or the cheap stock yep. or cheap company. So you would say value investing, security analysis, Benjamin Gray? It would be the best to start with. Thank you. And I don't know. I can't put my finger on a book. I've been thinking about it while you're answering. I'm going, every single new stage of my life, a new book has spoken to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't read value investing uh, until much later. I was more so on the business side. People think I started off investing. I don't think anyone starts off investing unless you're a trust fund baby. I started off in business. It was the business of real estate. Uh, and then I became an investor. So, I don't know. I think, I, really, I can't even pick it. Like, I, I mean, it stands out. Um, all right, I mean, just for entertainment's sake, I, well, actually, for truth's sake as well, uh, The Art of the Deal by Donald Trump, President Donald J. J. Trump. And I, I want to interject by my mind. No one starts on investing. Actually, I did. I mean, and I you was, started off investing. Well, I was so fascinated with money and what it meant and how it worked. I begged my dad to let me get in the stock market when I was 16, not knowing that the law, you have to be 18 or older. But there was a situation, I think it exists in Canada as well, I'm not sure, but it's called the Uniform Gift to Minors Act. And if your parent signs, it's okay. So I bought a fund that was a mutual fund on the DJI oh, wow. when I was 16 years old. How'd you get that money? Oh, I was given 25 cents a week allowance for like taking So you're smart, I was buying sweets and getting fat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I admire you in a lot of ways. And so it's funny that for that guy, because I was looking, maybe I had to dance, and it's mindset. I just yeah, always I was like that as a kid. But we lived out in the country, and there wasn't a lot of places. When I did ride my bike all the way, and it was, I don't know what, how many miles, or I wasn't 10. It's uh, probably like two miles, but when you're you know, eight years old, that seems like a long ways. And I would spend some of it on candy, but most of the time I just saved it. And, you know, the end of the story, people heard it so many times, so bear with me. But, you know, I kept getting these quarters, saving them, saving them, saving them. And I would stack, oh, it's 10 bucks, you know. And then one day I got a Johnson Slug, and I'm looking at that and I'm saying, this isn't silver. What is it? And can, how can that be as valuable as that? But none of the adults seem to be paying much yeah. attention to that. But no, I did save up and uh, didn't have a lot. I don't even to this day remember how much it was, probably just a few hundred dollars. But I just thought, how can you make a living by investing? Wow. And so you didn't get the uh, inclination to go when you made that first money to go to Monaco and pour champagne off a balcony for no reason? <laughs> no. That's what I had when I first started. <laughs> I did that. T take us through that. What do you want? Just took it through. What, what was the, the build-up to that? Take us I made it. money. I was 16 years old negotiating real estate deals. I was talking to, you know, experienced uh, managers of property development companies and taking 26 percent, 29 percent off the value of the property they were trying to sell, and then selling those properties to investors 
at great deals. And what we would do was negotiate 29% discounts and sell the properties each at 26% discounts. So you're making 3% margin on the property and charging a 1.5% finder's fee and having a return on the, uh, on the lawyer if they want to use your recommended lawyer and getting a kickback on the furniture package and getting a kickback on the mortgage fee. All of this was on the investor's behalf because they would have never been able to do this deal at this level by themselves because we were buying 18 units. It, would, it was easy to negotiate those deals. And then buying one unit or two units in each development and stacking those percentages onto that one unit. So you were getting you know, 45% discounts on one unit. So at that point, and, listen, and coming up in the hip hop age, I just wanted to have fun. You know? So my first inclination was to go to, you guys went to university, I went to Monaco. That's what happened. And then I, was, then I was brought back to life. Uh, I remember sitting at a uh, we went, we stayed at the same hotel at the Fairmont uh, in Monaco. And I, one morning I remember going, oh, I've got a flight to catch and there's two empty bottles of champagne. And standing over the balcony pouring the champagne over on, into the ocean, simply because I didn't want to leave it in the bottle for housekeeping to clean up. I, I'm, I've come a long way, David, since, <laughs> since now that you know you've learned a lot of lessons. I've learned a lot of lessons. That's just, that. That's just my story. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for sure. Yeah. Well, people love to get color, you know, I mean, that, that, in our real lives. We're all real people. Right. You know, we deal in the real world. We make mistakes, we have fun, we do whatever, right. and uh, I'm glad you shared that because it gives Listen, you... Anyone who focuses more on my, on, my, on my mistakes rather than what I'm actually doing now, I have no reason to talk to it. Like that's the way I look at it. Of course, everyone makes mistakes. Sure. Everyone has lessons, and if you don't learn from those lessons, that's the problem. Yeah. You know. So now I don't do that. Just mm -hmm. one bottle. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Interesting. So, so, so out of the deal by uh, President Donald J. Trump. And what's fascinating to me is having read that such a long time ago and looking at now how he's negotiating. It's the blueprint. Like it's in how he's negotiating now in different situations. Whether you agree with him or not, he's a much better negotiator than any other president we've had. the U.S. has had and the UK prime minister that the U.K. has had. He just knows how to run a negotiation. Um, and the first step is, nope, don't want that deal. Come back to me with something better. I'm walking away. Right. That's the first step of any negotiation. And he's 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 the only one that does that. Okay, let's. Uh... Let's bring the conversation a little bit back towards gold and silver, um, as we are now. And uh, okay, gold's been pretty you know, flat recently, not doing too much. Interest rate hike a couple of weeks ago. Gold obviously took a little bit of a dip, but then came back up. Then of course we had uh, this Monday, just a couple of days ago, the uh, bit of a flash crash there. Fat finger, yeah. Fat finger. Apparently, someone decided to uh, place a sell order and you know sold around twenty billion dollars worth of gold. Um, where do you see gold headed in the next immediate couple of years? Do you see it flatlining for the next couple of years? Or do you think that we'll have some kind of a pullback in gold silver? What are your thoughts mm. on that? Well, it's always possible for another pullback. I do believe that the bottom is in. I think the bottom was reached uh, for this part of the cycle in December 2015. And I think that's it. Uh, whether or not we test the 1620 in silver in the you know, 1115 gold again or not remains to be determined. I doubt it, but it's possible. Flat line, yes, through the summer probably. But I think in the fall to the end of the year, it's probably going to be up noticeably, but only noticeably if you're really involved in this market. I'm looking at 2018, 19, 20 as being uh, substantially higher over time. And I'm looking for, like all markets, once gold and silver get overvalued, to get extremely overvalued. Because if we see those markets moving up, while let's say the stock and bond markets are moving down, there'll be huge momentum into those markets and they're very tiny markets. So if people are driven by fear, it's a bigger driver than greed actually. So if, they, if that scenario takes place, and I believe it could, you would see large money trying to fit into a very small market. Because people in the bond market, or the amount of money in the bond market is astronomical. The amount of money in the currencies markets is astronomical. So if you're worried about what's going to happen to your currency, you're worried what's happening with your long-term pension fund, mostly based in the bond market, and the equity market is not performing, there's only one market to go to. And 
under that condition, you'll see a rise in the paper price of gold and silver that will probably go to record books. And I actually believe that we're setting ourselves up for that kind of scenario. Okay. Manish, I know you don't like to speculate much at all. Yeah, I don't speculate. I think, uh, and really, you had just heard from the person whose speculation I like to listen to. So <laughs> there's nothing more for me to say. I don't, I'll just react to whatever happens whenever it happens. Yeah, okay. And uh, of course, a lot of people will be wondering at this stage, you know, obviously, we're not, you know, saying the end of the world is going to happen or anything like that. And you really <coughs> must have gold just simply to get by the end of the world, the collapse of society, and so on. <laughs> but, uh, you know, obviously, some people do buy into that theory, and, and that's why have you got a Magnum 44 shoved down your pants? <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's to protect my. Uh, to protect myself, <laughs> in case that happens, you, you never know when it will happen. But um, okay, so a lot of people will probably be thinking, right? Okay, I'm a rational investor. I like real estate. I like stocks. Why should I have some gold in my portfolio? Gold doesn't do anything. It doesn't give me a return. Why should I have some? Is it is it just a mere fact of <clears throat> you know giving you that hedge against your real estate, against your stocks, against your bonds, whatever else you're investing in? A portfolio manager would say exactly that. It's a hedge. And it is. I mean, primarily, most people, most investment professionals look at it as a hedge. The beauty about gold and silver for life is that you can have an asset and also get a cash flow on it. And this is something that isn't taught very many places. And that's why I'm so happy to, you know, be with you guys and present it to, you know, people that uh, follow my work. Because there's a lot of fallacies in the market, and one is that gold provides no return. A physical gold coin does not. But now with the sophistication in these markets, you can cash flow almost anything. Yeah. And you specialize in teaching people how to cash flow gold and silver. So it, it, it gets over one of the main objections in today's market. Well, David, if you're right, and we're in a long-term trading channel, why would I buy gold now? I have to wait for it to break the channel either the upside and go long or the downside and go short which is perfectly reasonable. But a lot of money can be made, especially as maybe the silver market is an example. When it had a 20-year flat bottom, let's say, around the $5 uh, level, you could have sold puts for 20 years, and it's called the uh, bank like a bookie. I mean, uh, Dave Kaplan taught uh, opportunities and options, which I had a pretty large account at way back when. And he taught that trading methodology that he just sold puts all the way along. Yep. And if you could get put the metal five dollars and do better than any major silver mining company on the planet, if it got put to you, right. what's wrong with that? Right. There's another book called You Can't Lose Trading Commodities. And in fact, the author of that book used to be a client of one of my commodities brokers. Right. The point I'm making is that his premise is very simple. If you can buy a commodity under the cost of production or substantially under the cost of production and have some patience, you really can't lose. There's probably exceptions to that, but I can't think of one. So that's a good market, and one I know, one, you know, the best market I know really is a silver market. But people don't know these things, but if you bring them in a forum like this, it at least opens them up to the possibilities to think that there's a lot of possibilities in the investing world that people know about, but they have to learn them, be taught them, or showing them, or turn their money over to somebody to manage or whatever, that understands how markets work rather than just complain, hey, it's going nowhere. Hey, it's going nowhere, and I'm making 14% a year. How do you like that? Mm, I like that. Yep, I, mean, I know Ray Dalio often says, you know, if you don't own any gold, you don't understand economics or business. Ah, that's my favorite quote. Or history. I don't even like to explain. Nobody should, you know, there's enough content and education out there, especially some of your stuff, uh, and Mike Maloney stuff that explains why somebody should own gold. And if you don't want to spend the time looking at the way that these guys have made it entertaining for you to look at, then go and study history. And if you don't want to do that, then I don't need to talk to you. Nobody should care more about your money than you do. That's right. So more than just a store of value, it's also a hedge. Yes. It's the ultimate hedge, right? It is. And it's a hedge, you know, I mean, Martin Armstrong, I mean, we have different views on a few things, but you know, Martin says, well, it's not an inflation hedge, and he makes a good point, you know, and I've probably said it is, 
It's a lot of things. I call it, like Doug Casey, it's a crisis hedge. Right. It's a crisis hedge. And Martin, and I agree with him, it's really a hedge against government. People say, oh, well, government always can rush to the rescue no matter what happens. Look at the bail-ins that happened in the 2008 crisis. You know, the Fed was there, which is really not the government, but perceived to be part of the government. It's kind of quasi-government entity. I don't want to get into that argument. But the point is that no one really considers or is willing to voice is that governments fail. Governments do fail. And that's something that, that no one wants to really acknowledge, that that can happen. But just ask, you know, someone from the Roman Empire. There aren't many living today. But my point being that the empires do fail. And that's where I believe we are. Does it mean the end of the world? That's the whole thing. A financial collapse means that the assets are reset and some people end up owning them and other people don't. Right. And you want to be on the side that ends up owning them, especially if you can get them at a large discount, versus the people that are over leveraged or don't use debt properly or basically bought into a system that isn't based on fundamental facts. Okay, so just, just expanding a little bit more on our asset classes then, and we'll have to wrap up shortly, but we'll just expand a little bit more. A lot of people tend to, I mean, a lot of people that I speak to, and a lot of young investors, new investors, they tend to get very stressed. They tend to kick themselves, thinking, I should have been invested in this asset class because it's done really well in the last 10 years. I've been invested in this asset class for the last 10 years. I should have been invested in that. And they fill themselves up with regret and they before hate, they even start before they, you know, or anything else, or whatever it is. Even that's even like the policy have. of commercialism: hate yourself and give me your money. That's yeah. Go on, sorry. No, no. I mean, it's so that's that's a common theme among a lot of people. They say, "Oh, I'm mean, invested in this asset class." Do you think that a lot of people they just need to do their homework to begin with, and then doesn't matter if this asset class over here overtakes the one they're invested in. They need to simply go back to the fundamentals and remind themselves of why they got into that particular investment. Is, is, is that a problem? I, I kind of get the feeling that you know, perhaps Warren Buffett hints about this a lot more, saying, you know, if company you're invested in company A and company B does extremely well, you have to re constantly remind yourself not to get out of company A, but go back to the fundamentals and, and realize why you invested your money in company A in the beginning. And say, right, okay, company B's done really well over the last five years, but over the next 10 years, company A will slowly, slowly win the race eventually. And do you think, from a psychology point of view, from an investor psychology point of view, it's really important to manage that? How does one manage that in times of, for example, if someone has been invested in gold for the last five years and they've chosen gold over Bitcoin, for example, like we had this discussion with someone on the way to, to, to the hotel we're staying in right now, one of our clients, in fact, and uh, you know he was sort of kicking himself about not being invested in Bitcoin. Is, is that a trap people can get fall, you know, could fall in right now? You know, if, if someone sells their gold holdings and, and buys those of Bitcoin, would that be a major mistake they're making, do you reckon? Well, Deep, I think it's a great question. I think you answered it partly. But the way I would answer it is, you know, the old Oracle of Delphi to that own self be true. The way to really master the markets is to master yourself. And you need to understand that nature preaches balance. There's a balance between, you know, real estate the stock market in general, and the hedge, gold and silver. It's really simple as the triangle that you talked about yesterday. And that's really the major asset classes. And they ebb and flow, because sometimes real estate's overvalued, sometimes gold is overvalued. It hasn't been in quite some time, but it can be, it has been. Uh, and then the stock market's undervalued, fair value, and overvalued. So it's a balancing act. But it also comes back to what makes you comfortable. And you have to be a realist. You cannot have what I call an amateur's attitude that as soon as you buy something, it has to go up. And, you know, one of the early lessons in the Sunday school that my daughters got was it's unfair to compare. And people do this all the time. We're all given different bodies, we're all given different IQs, we're all given different nationalities or whatever. The point is that we're all human beings. Most of these things are human problems. But we're taught to look at the differences. And we should really look at your now, you know, you can look at the differences, but the point I'm making is to look inward and say, you know, I am the type of person that likes to invest one time and not think about this investment forever. I just want that at the end of the year I'm making, you know, 7%, year after that 7%, year after that 7%. If that's your nature, then that's the type of investment you should look for. But no one looks at themselves first and invests. 
they invest first and then look at what they did wrong. Right. And there's a huge emphasis on, you know, what is wrong with you. I mean, look at society at large. You know, you don't know how to work out and get a personal trainer. You don't know how to eat right by this diet book. You don't know how to, uh, you know, use your iPhone, get this, or you don't know how to use your computer, get the idiot's guide to the computer, and you're, you're deemed an idiot, oh, yeah. you know, right from the start. And it's like so, a joke. Yeah, and so there's all this negativity that's constantly being subtly forced upon you, and you get this idea that, geez, I can't do anything. Right, right, right. And the most important thing, really, you can learn in life, in my view, and I'm getting philosophical, but I'm really answering the question to the best of my ability, and that is, if you don't know who you are, and what makes you tick, and what your style of investing is, then you're really going to have a difficult time because the market will exploit anything that that you haven't figured out for your own self. If you're impatient, the market will teach you patience. Yeah. If you're too aggressive, the market will teach you you're too aggressive. If you're not balanced and put all your money in the gold and think that you're right just because you heard someone so talk about it and didn't do your own research or learn that I say, hey, 10 percent is right for most people, 20 percent for most. If you're really aggressive, maybe higher than that, but. You know, not ever say put everything in the gold, never. Yep. But yet people get the idea that, oh, Mike Maloney, and uh, whatever it is. And that's blaming others, which everyone's taught to do. But why look inward and see what I did wrong, or why I did it, or learn from it? Balanced people are balanced investors. Yep. Balanced investors know that all markets have and flow. And you did a marvelous job of talking about that yesterday. I don't think I can give a better answer than that. Honestly speaking, I think you've just highlighted every single thing that I can think of that would cause somebody to do that. So there's no, I won't even try and give a better answer than that. Well, okay. I think uh, our time is nearly up. So uh, I'd just like to say thank you very much for David. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's been a pleasure well, having you over the last two days. Thank you, thank you for Minish as well. Thank you, Z. Thank it's been you, a pleasure to, you, uh, to have you in the last two days at this conference we're holding in London for all of our clients. Uh, please do uh, leave You need to show everyone the, oh. David's gold iPhone. Look at right. that. Look at that. That's a solid <laughs> so, yeah. 24 karat 24 gold, karat iPhone. gold iPhone right there. That's amazing. And it works. It's real. It's not just a His a look. Or David's like swag is undeniable. <laughs> <laughs> it's notorious <laughs> in these streets of gold and silver. <laughs> so, anyway, um, thank you guys. It's been an awesome two days we've had in London with our clients. Uh, we had a client mastermind here in London. It's going to be uh, an annual thing now for all of our clients. And uh, we're looking forward to next year's event as well. Hope to make it even better. For those of you watching on uh, Facebook Live, we'll be looking through your comments and questions and, and seeing how best we can answer them on, on our next podcast or our next uh, video session. And then those of you watching this on YouTube, please leave a, a comment, a question. You know, did you like the video? Did you find it helpful? Uh, what parts did you find helpful? Any questions you want us to answer on the uh, the next video? So uh, for myself, and share it share it with one person that you think needs to hear anything we said. Absolutely, right. share it. If you if you think someone can benefit from it, please do share it as well. So uh, from me, from Minesh, from David, thank you all very much, and uh, we'll look forward to uh, speaking with you guys and, and having a further discussion about things at some point in the future. Thank you. So, yeah. Let's check the Facebook Live, see if there's any comments that we can answer for those guys on here.